Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for uh, the invitation and for all the efforts you've put into organizing this meeting. And what I'd like to talk to you about is uh, a particular topic, uh, the, the phenomenon, a model for the phenomenon of uh, courtship feeding and nuptial gifts, and I'll show you some pictures of what that is in a minute and then also indicate to you my approach to modeling social behavior. <clears throat> now, um, courtship feeding occurs in uh, both vertebrates and invertebrates, and this is an example from, uh, from birds, as you can see. These are uh, great tits here, and courtship feeding in the, in the ornithology literature usually refers to a male, an adult male feeding an adult female. And this occurs uh, during ovulation uh, quite often and during, uh, and, and while the egg is, is uh, in the female's body. And then after the egg is laid and through the time of, uh, up until the time of fledgling. So that's the maximum duration that the courtship feeding can occur but it could also occur for shorter intervals of time. And this is a co another common example that we see in Hawaii, uh, where this is the introduced uh, northern cardinal, which is uh, now widespread in Hawaii. We can see this on our porch. And this I have in here just as a lovely shot of uh, uh, courtship feeding in seabirds. And this also occurs in insects. And I have only one slide of insects here. These are katydids. And frequently, this is, these are called nuptial gifts. And what's going on here is that a male will give the female a large mass. Uh, the large mass is often attached to uh, sperm. And these are flies in which this happens as well. And the uh, typical interpretation among an entomologists is that this is a device to ensure copulation time. But there's increasing evidence, particularly from katydids, that is, this is copulation time in the sense that uh, the copulation occurs during the period that the male is giving the female this food. And however, there's also increasing evidence from katydids and, and others that some of this material is actually incorporated into the eggs. So the, the t interpretation typ typically among ornithologists is that courtship feeding is used to increase the fecundity of the female. And so by providing the female with nutrients, more, more eggs are laid that the, female, or that the male can sire. Whereas the interpretation usually for insects is that the courtship feeding is specifically to acquire the opportunity to mate However, that's, it's, there's also evidence that, that there might be some so-called paternal investment involved here as well uh, in the sense that the material is used, is incorporated uh, into eggs and leads to higher fecundity. Now, the approach that I've been taking to modeling social behavior is indicated by this diagram. And I sh should perhaps begin by saying that I approached the evolution of social behavior from a background in population and community ecology. And over the last 40, 50 years, there have been a number of developments in that area of ecology, which uh, I think would be appropriate in modeling social behavior as well. One of them is the um, development of models that are so-called bottom-up and or sometimes the phrase individual-based models are used. So back uh, in the 70s, uh, typically models in population dynamics were framed from a top-down point of view. That is, models that you may have heard of, like the logistic equation and the logical terror equation, are stipulated a priori as applying to a population. And um, the problem with top-down models in ecology has been twofold. First, they're remote, turn out to be remote from the mechanisms by which population dynamics occurs. But more importantly, Steve Smale, who's a mathematician some of you may know, uh, showed that 
the predictions from uh, Vodka Volterra style models were not structurally stable and, and that there were serious, seriously different predictions that could be obtained from population dynamic models depending on fine details of their formulation. So this required that ecologists develop models based on the mechanism of population dynamics and, and um, based on the mechanisms of growth and reproduction directly so that they could be uh, pretty confident about what the model was. So that's what led to the emphasis on uh, bottom-up modeling. And the other main uh, phenomenon, the main approach or strategy has been to uh, comes from so-called life history theory, which is the theory that predicts uh, when animals should begin breeding and how long they should live their lives. And the approach in, in ecology to model something like when would a plant flower, what would be the optimal time for a plant to flower, which would be a classic problem in life history theory. You start at the end of the growing season and you work backwards recursively to find out when the best time would be. So this would be uh, a backward induction uh, style of logic. And my approach to uh, social behavior is the same, in the sense, and, I, and I carry this with me, so that it seems to me that, that a profitable approach to modeling social behavior is to model the behavior itself as the first class object and work up from there to population genetics. And similarly, in discussing phenomena like uh, mating strategies, <clears throat> I would begin by, stud by looking at what uh, is necessary to produce offspring and work back to mating as uh, setting up the social infrastructure from which offspring emerge. And both of these uh, uh, strategies that I take differ from the common approach uh, in this field. Now, turning specifically to uh, nuptial gifts and courtship feeding, I've been particularly enchanted uh, by the uh, area of economics called the theory of the firm. And this uh, particularly began to flourish during the 1970s and treats a great many of the same questions that behavioral ecologists and, and evolutionary uh, social behavior theorists have treated quite independently. And there have been a number of models that economists working on the theory of the firm have developed that seem to me could be uh, imported with some changes into social behavior. And the principal agent model is one of the most elementary of the models treated in the theory of the firm. And it refers here to the principal who's the owner of a company uh, of a firm and the agent who's the firm's employee. And the general problem being addressed is what the compensation should be from the principal to the agent in order to achieve an alignment of incentives, an alignment of interests. And this would be, this would be a pretty canonical model for, uh, uh, from, uh, of a principal agent type just applied here to the question of nuptial feeding. So this would be the fitness and by, by the fitness right here, I mean the daily increment of fitness increase. So if you're starting to model behavior at the behavioral level, then uh, the problem is one of looking at, at uh, behavioral actions as leading, cumulated over the lifespan to, a, to the kind of fitness you'd use in a population genetic intergenerational model. So WF right here is the fitness increment the daily increment for a female. And it's, I'm assuming right here this is equal to the nuptial gift, and operationally I'm taking the nuptial gift as being the material the male gives to the female prior to copulation or any subsequent reproduction. And uh, so it's a payment in advance. And C is the courtship feeding, which occurs <coughs> during the copulation or and or the subsequent raising of the offspring. And, um, and then this is the compensation that the 
that the female pays the male. The female is the principal in this case. And M is the um, compensation rate per unit of courtship feeding. And then this is the female's outside option. And this is the, comp this is the fitness rate for the male. And this represents uh, what it's being compensated for, uh, for its courtship feeding. And this is a, uh, an example of a, of a cost term, the, how much it costs the male to go get that food. And um, uh, this term is the cost of the nuptial gift. And the policy decision in this problem is for the female to decide M the compensation rate it will, she will supply to the male per unit of courtship feeding. And the policy uh, decision for the male is to decide the amount of courtship feeding it should give, he should give, and possibly the nuptial gift. Now the nuptial gift, if the nuptial gift is positive, it means that the male is giving the female something, but the nuptial gift could also be negative in the case where the female has to induce the male. That's the um, remote case. S stands for sires. So that's the amount of sires that the male gets as a result of this compensation he's supplied. Now, uh, just to jump to the results here. Results are, are kind of complicated, actually. Um, now, first of all, if the, male and, if the female and the male are playing against each other, so to speak, as, uh, almost as adversaries, then uh, you can solve for the Nash competitive equilibrium, which I'm indicating as this dot down here. And for the numerical values I was using, it happens to be that um, this would be the male's fitness gain, this is the female's fitness gain, and you compute the optimal um, uh, degree of courtship feeding associated with this. Now, in this situation, the the, nupti, the optimal nuptial gift would actually be zero. Now, what's interesting is that there's a different possibility altogether, which is studied in this literature. This is uh, not original with me. The other possibility is that if you take the sum of the fitnesses of both the male and the female, you get the total excess possible. And uh, you can solve quite easily for a degree of nuptial feeding, a degree of courtship feeding, a C, and an M, a, a compensation rate, which leads to a win-win solution for the male and the female. And this is where the, comp the cooperation comes in, which is, of course, the theme of this workshop. Now, um, it, you can exhibit a, uh, a whole set of points in here which represent so to speak, win-win solutions to the uh, uh, male and the female. The minimum gift that the male could give and still come out equal to its, to its previous uh, point, and the maximum that the gift, gift could give, which would boost the female's fitness the most, would be 3 eighths. And in, for the interval of points in here along this line, there are strategies of cooperation which are win-win from both points of view. And this point right here is especially interesting. This is the Nash bargaining solution, which you compute as the pair, the, um, the optimal compensation rate, the optimal M, and, and the optimal N, the nuptial gift, that simultaneously so it's the pair that maximizes the product of the two fitnesses. If you form the product of the two fitnesses right here, you obtain an expression called the Nash product. And the maximization of that gives you the Nash bargaining solution. And some of you know Nash uh, suggested this as a, a good candidate for an optimal solution in a bargaining problem. And it's relative, relative, relative to taking the Nash competitive solution as a so-called threat point. When, he, when Ash was working on this problem, it's very interesting. He had the labor management uh, negotiation as a, as a case study. And um, in the case of the labor management negotiation, the, the labor can, of course, go out on strike and manage can have a lockout. management can have a lockout. Both of these represent threats. And for a threat to be credible, they actually have to do it now and then and show 
the opposing party that they will uh, uh, um, be willing to suffer the pain of actually in incurring the threat. And uh, in light of the threat point, then, uh, then the, the best compromise uh, works out to be the product of the 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 uh, the max the maximum of the product of their two uh, utilities. Now, when uh, so, so this is cooperation, but it's not altruism. Uh, it's definitely uh, a, a kind of cooperation which is mediated by the necessity uh, to bargain. Now, um, Nash left unspecified how you reach an, a max. Uh, a Nash bargaining solution, and we in biology, I think, have taken it for granted that animals can't do this because there are no laws and there are no institutions and uh, so forth. But there might very well be the emergence of what you might call biological norms of behavior or biological institutions through repeated <coughs> interactions. Now, I've suggested now that there are schemes of uh, back and forth. Uh, dickering around between animals, which could, could lead to a Nash uh, bargaining solution. But I suggested that there's another type as well, which involves the uh, experience of reciprocal pleasure through intimate social contact, through intimate physical contact. And here's an example right here, if you look at uh, lots of primates, of animals that are very hanging out very closely together. And actually, if you think about it, there are a great many animal species in which physically touching one another is a large part of their daily life. And one might wonder why they're doing this. Um, it ranges from, from primates that you see right here, but you've probably seen birds sometimes who, who uh, groom each other's uh, uh, feathers. You can look at parrots and find a, a parrot you know, taking its bill, running its bill through the feathers of another parrot. And then you also see all of this social interaction, physically intimate contact uh, in sexual relations. And here's uh, an example of two male lions. You see there, and this is a same-sex uh, interaction right here. This was shot by a photographer uh, from Brazil. And you see this one male mounts the other male. And if you run it again, for example, you can see that uh, there's a, a friendship or an affiliation that's going in it. And so it raises the question of why are they doing this? And so I've hypothesized that all of these uh, behaviors that involve physical intimacy represent a proximal mechanism for obtaining a Nash, something like a Nash bargaining solution. Now, uh, furthermore, uh, getting back to the model, there are lots of cases you can study right here which involve uh, um, allowing for outside options. So neither can have an outside option. One of them can have an outside option. The male or the female could have an outside option, or both could have outside options. And I don't propose to go into these in a lot of detail. This manuscript is available uh, uh, online. Was like, I gave this talk to the economics department at the University of Hawaii uh, a couple months ago, and it's available uh, from their website as a pre-publication paper. Now, uh, one other thing that occurs in th this courtship feeding is that occasionally the courtship feeding terminates. And, and you might ask, what is the condition for the courtship feeding to stop? And with a fairly familiar calculation, you can go through the temptation. You can look at what the temptation to defect is, which would be, for the case of the female, receiving the nuptial gift, receiving the courtship feeding, but not paying the compensation. And uh, she can only do that once. And if she does that once, thereafter, her so-called punishment would be to have uh, j just to be able to enjoy the outside option. So she never gets any more cold, any feeding. And uh, the benefit to the female of continued uh, courtship feeding is her fitness evaluated at the Nash bargaining solution uh, with the uh, 
uh, corresponding um, compensation rate. Similarly, there's a condition for the male to terminate the relationship, which you can go through here. And in the usual uh, type of computation, you calculate the expected fitness over the, over the breeding season of the day-to-day -day activities. So this would be the, the, the expected fitness over the, over the season for the female would be, the, if she divorces, would be to benefit from the temptation first off, but thereafter just live through the, um, uh, just accept the penalty payment and as a function of L, which is the probability of living from day to day. And similarly, you can compute the probability of, or, or the fitness she would obtain if she uh, lived, uh, if, if she didn't defect and live from day to day. And then you do the summation. And you compute, uh, quite simply, the, the threshold daily survival for continued pairing. What's interesting about this is that the threshold daily survival has to be greater than, than the larger of these two for the pair to consist. And the data are that the uh, probability of, a, of a, a divorce gets higher and higher in species where there's uh, a lot of mortality. And so in, more, in high mortality species, you would get more divorces and less of this courtship feeding. Now I'd like to uh, briefly mention a couple other points. Uh, the, the principal agent problem is one example from the theory of the firm, which might be useful to us. Uh, another one that I've explored at uh, some length uh, comes from a theorem, some work of Groves, uh, pertaining to uh, incentives in a conglomerate. A conglomerate is a kind of company that has a parent holding company in it it makes its money from subdivisions. And this suggested the analogy that the parent company is literally a parent in biology and that the offspring might be viewed as divisions, uh, so to speak, because the parent earns its fitness through the, uh, through the offspring. And so therefore that sets up a, in order to have honest uh, 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 communication from the parent to the offspring. You can set this up as an auction, and this is following the, uh, the treatment in Groves. So the, the parent can sol solicit from the offspring its so-called demand curve, and on the basis of that, the parent can set the price for food. And the price for food would be the amount of food that uh, a parent would give the offspring per unit of offspring begging. And the begging is expensive. And so this would be the kind of result. This, would, this is an optimal demand curve right here. Horizontal axis is price. Vertical axis is food quantity. And um, you can see the bigger, the higher the price of the food, the less food the chick will demand optimally. And taking that into account, if that's communicated to the female, uh, to the parent, then the parent can compute the best price from its point of view. So this is the fitness of the parent as a function of the price it's charging the, uh, the offspring. And the peak right here would be the optimal price. And based on that price, uh, you would have a, a completed negotiation. Now, what's interesting about this is that if you let the chick have the ability to feed itself to some extent, these curves, you get a... Um, um, transition from having no optimum, from having an optimum to having no optimum price. And I'm interpreting this as uh, the uh, size, as, as indicating um, the weaning of the chick. So as the chick grows through time, it's uh, uh, <coughs> these curves right here. It says the chick grows through time and increases in its ability to catch prey and to feed itself, there comes a point where it is no longer profitable for the uh, parent to feed the offspring at all. And at that point, the weaning occurs. So from a model like this, which is very mechanism-based, you can actually predict when the bird should, uh, fledge, bird should be fledged. 
And then what do you do with models like this? Well, in principle, as I men mentioned before, what you do is you take the day-to-day uh, uh, -day fitnesses uh, and you add them up and you get the lifetime fitnesses and then you plug the lifetime fitnesses into a population genetic model which operates between generations. So we're going from a, a behavioral tier to an evolutionary tier, if you will. And this is an example of a, a model of that genre that uh, Errol Ache and I published. This, for example, uh, imagines that there is one locus and two alleles at a, at a, uh, in a genetic system, and that if the A2 allele is fixed, that animals are playing a game with this payoff matrix, and then you can compute uh, that uh, there's some, some, actually some kind of nice results here. You can compute the conditions under which the A2 allele is replaced by the A1 allele, which has a different payoff matrix. And in this way, you can study, in a population genetic way, the evolution of the payoff matrix. And so you don't have to take, and in my opinion, should not take, for evolutionary reasoning, the, the game itself as being fixed, but the game itself should evolve. And so we would, in my group's approach to modeling social behavior, we would model the social behavior and let the parameters of the social game evolve at a higher uh, tier like this. And finally, um, I'm shameless enough to give you a commercial. Um, this is uh, my first book uh, as I began looking into social behavior. It's called Evolution's Rainbow, and it's now uh, translated into uh, uh, Portuguese in Brazil and into Korean and my most recent book The Genial Gene is also now translated into French. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much Joan. So do we have any questions? Yes. I think you mentioned at the beginning that these traditional models like Locke of Volterra Steve Smale and others have shown are unstable with small yeah, changes. Right. What about the stability of uh, these nuptial models to noise, environmental noise, time-dependent fluctuations? Uh, would that change things significantly? Well, of course, it depends if the noise enters linearly or nonlinearly, and uh, so it depends on the details. <coughs> Actually, the way that economists usually write this model down uh, is by including noise in the very beginning. Um, and there, a, a lot of the discussion among economists has to do with knowledge and with what the parties know about one another. And that's often taken as a random variable. Uh, in the framing that I've given, I've actually taken that out because I didn't think it added anything. You wound up getting expectations that were the same as deterministic variables. And I think it would take a more subtle use of noise to get the results being changed relative to the framing that economists have. And I have to say my own inclination is to make the model as simple as possible and not to put in extra generality that you don't actually use. And that's why I've, I stripped out uh, a lot of the, the linear noise from a model where the expectations were the same as the deterministic result. The nonlinear noise? Yeah, well, there wasn't any. Well, that would matter, sure. Um, but then. That's not what was in the economist's framing either. So we would, so we'd have to uh, really work on that. And shall I answer a question? Yeah, go, go ahead. Are, are you calling the people or am I? Okay. Thank you. I'm just curious what you think is the best way to test these models in a very precise way, in the sense of what class of organisms, uh, how low in the evolutionary history we should go where it is possible to make a graph of experimental observation versus some control parameter that, that you can twiddle. So is it uh, something where we can do genetic modifications to a class of organisms and look for changes and then compare it to this kind of model? What's the best way to proceed? Um, well, uh, that, that would work. Uh, that is to say, make, looking at uh, mutations and developing an array of different uh, behavioral types and then seeing how they function. That might be quite expensive, though. And 
I think given the, the state of, the, of knowledge in this, a lot of the testing can be done comparatively. Um, there are very clear qualitative predictions that come out of the proposition that the nuptial gifts and courtship feeding represents a competitive solution versus a cooperative solution. Now, one can basically inspect qualitatively whether those different situations occur. Uh, the, uh, as you know, we don't have a, a large history in biology of understanding cooperation, hence the reason for a conference like this. We're, we've been raised with how to think about competition. We know a lot about how to think about competition. And so we don't often even have good ex, uh, experimental designs to detect cooperation. So in, I, I don't see in these evolutionary argument, in these evolutionary models, yet the chance to make, as you put it, precise uh, predictions, uh, quantitatively precise predictions. And I'm not sure the field wants that. And if I can digest, digress just a second. When I used to be working in marine ecology, we were, uh, we developed population models for barnacles along the California coast here. And barnacles, it happens, uh, have a larval phase that goes out of the ocean and it comes back to shore. And we worked out a model for the general picture of that, and then we got more and more refined so that we could actually make quantitative predictions of the amount of barnacles that could be on a rock, taking into account data from buoys and from satellites and, and so on to know what the state of the ocean was. And the reviews we began to get were uh, that this was overkill, that people really weren't interested in the holy grail of quantitative predictions from models to data. And that is still my picture of the biological peer group in this area. I'm not sure the demand for quantitative predictions comes from, from biologists. It tends to come from theoreticians or sometimes from, from, from physicists, if I might. And, but I'm not sure it's really there. Most biologists are interested in getting the qualitative story right. And, and it's not often that that desire is um, satisfied with quantitative prediction, with quantitative accuracy. If I could just yeah. follow up on that. So yeah. for instance, it's a two-part question that might have the same answer, which is, what's the most primitive organism that you would think displays this kind of behavior? And is it sufficiently simple that it's amenable to genetic modification? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, um, uh, all these insects would certainly be genetically amenable. Uh, but it's funny, when I talk with uh, uh, yeast biologists, for example, I, I often talk, talk to, to, to microbial biologists, microbiologists, and they accuse me of being a vertebrate chauvinist, which I am, because <laughs> I, my own, the species I work on the most are lizards. And um, they, uh, say that, well, yeast can do this, you know, and okay. Uh, and of course, if they can, then wow, there's an incredible uh, experimental uh, feasibility possible. Rick? Yeah. Yeah, Rick. So um, when I've heard various versions of this talk with you, three to five years, and you sort of refined uh -huh. notion of how these sort of teams form and yeah. what kinds of behaviors are involved in their reinforcement. One of the things I have troubles with understanding or reconciling is the notion of genetic conflicts of interest with um, the sort of fitness kinds of conflicts of interest. Could you speak that, up? I'm sorry. Oh, here's the microphone. So one of the challenges that I find just in conceptualizing and integrating this framework into my own framework as an evolutionary geneticist is trying to understand how our notion of conflicts of interest that arise due to differing asymmetries and patterns of relatedness can be incorporated into these kinds of models. Um, so that the conflicts that, that there's an accounting for of the sort of trans differences in efficiency, if you will, 
of transmission of the genes that might underlie these behaviors and conflicts in the cell might, might emerge from those related to say symmetries. Well, uh, in other words, how does kin selection fit into this? Okay, uh, kin selection in particular uh, affects, I, I think, the costs, uh, the relative pr pr prices you would charge. Um, so if, uh, if we, if we take, go, go ahead to this one, which is where there's much more chance for conflict, suppose there are two offspring here or three offspring in a more complicated uh, conglomerate. Well then, uh, the, the demand curve and the price for food, these curves right here, wind up being dependent on the coefficient of genetic relationship between uh, the, the parent and the, the various offspring and the various offspring with one another. So the, the kinship, uh, kinship and relatedness is definitely important but it's not a driver in this kind of uh, approach. It's uh, a, a factor that you need to consider in the quantitative uh, study of the pricing. So there's definitely a conflict. But as you know, we've been raised to think about conflict. Conflict is in our um, blood, if you will, if, in, thinking about uh, how animals interact, how genes interact, and so on. And I, I think where, I don't mean to pontificate here, but just where we need more experience is, is in intuiting how cooperation forms, what, what's in it for both parties to cooperate. And when we get a better intuition for that, we'll know how to look for it and know how to, how to have a better perspective on how much conflict goes on versus how much cooperation goes on. Because co con conflict is not conflict, that is to say, is not the default case. Now, um, f the fitness, fitness advantage might be the, is, would be the uh, default case. Would, we would take that as given. But fitness advantage doesn't require conflict. And so therefore, uh, as we get more experience with what situations underlie, in what situations cooperation underlies fitness <coughs> advantage versus conflict, then I think we'll get a more balanced view of, of that. Uh, one more question, um, very quick. <laughs> so uh, just a follow-up to the last question, really. Uh, could we not tell a story um, which uses inclusive fitness and the... Yeah. <coughs> Can we not sort of, um, okay, first thing, I, I think we can be uh, glorious about explanations here, so we don't need to have one explanation to claim to be the only explanation here. Um, and I, I think the inclusive fitness um, school can give an explanation in terms of the fitness advantage to both parents, both of whom are, um, has the same relatedness to the offspring. Um, so there'd be uh, a cost to the males for providing the food, but presumably that increases the um, fecundity of the female, and therefore of his own, his own fecundity by, you know, because they're both equally related. But of course he's got a opportunity to, to mate elsewhere as well, perhaps depending on the life history of this particular organism. And so you, you, can, you could probably frame an optimization problem in those terms as well, and, and solve I don't disagree with that, though. But the problem is, is that I think we need more than that approach. And there, there are two mm -hmm. issues I would raise with the, with the sort of modeling strategy you've just laid out right there. One is that it would tend to be top down. It would tend to require as a solution concept the ESS from Maynard Smith, and uh, that, in my view, is basically a top down solution concept. It involves attaching strategies to genes and then looking at conditions under which you get a genetic equilibrium. And then from that, you're supposed to trickle down into what the behavior should look like. And I'm finding that the same objections to that type of, to that logic, that uh, 
we've already encountered in population ecology also occur here. And I think, it's, I think that strategy leads to predictions that are remote from the phenomena. And, uh, and so that the behavior then is a second class object rather than a first class object. And then also, I, I think that the ESS solution concept is not the only concept we should be considering when it comes to behavior. Because while, the, while gene pool dynamics may equilibrate at an ESS, it's not clear that behavioral dynamics uh, set, uh, uh, obey the same constraint because you very well could have the evolution of behavioral mechanisms that culminate in different solutions other than the Nash competitive equilibrium, namely the Nash bargaining solution. And then there are, are multi-strategy type extensions of those. So uh, that would be my problem with this, the strategy that you laid out. It has nothing to do with having any objections to taking relatedness into account it has to do with whether we should really be doing the modeling bottom up rather than top down and whether our, and whether the ESS concept is sufficient for uh, studying uh, behavioral games. Yeah. That's it. Okay, thank you. Okay,